So as I think most of you heard, right, this class does not meet next week, right? I have to take my wife to Jacksonville for some for minor surgery. Um, I'll be out of town for a couple of days. Um, and my department chair said, like, look, just make shit easy on yourself for once, you know, and, you, and cancel your classes. So that's what we're doing. Canceling class next week. Go to your other classes. You go to your other classes. Just don't come to this one. All right, so uh, the next homework assignment, um, I just wanted to sort of have this up here while I still had your absolute focus attention, um, is on page 117 in Running Analytically, it's assignment one, and what I want you to do is try to find and explain five enthymemes. Now, do any of you know what an enthymeme is? No. no. Okay, I didn't think so, that's fine. We're gonna spend some time on that. Um, so, but to understand an enthymeme, we have to start with another kind of reasoning problem on which the enthymeme is based, right? Have any of you ever heard of a syllogism? Do we get points marked off if we say no? You do not get points marked <laughs> off if you say no, no. Okay. You, you do not get points marked off for honesty in cases like this. No, no. Okay. Have any of you ever seen this particular little verbal formula before? Right. All humans are mortal. Socrates is human. Ergo, Socrates is mortal. Okay, so when I, when I phrase it like this, some of you have seen something like this before? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so what a syllogism is, is a means for testing the validity, the logical validity of a particular statement, right? It has three parts. The first sentence we call the major premise, and the major premise is a general statement. That usually describes some broad category of being, right? So here we have a statement, our major premise, that applies to all humans, right? We say all humans are mortal. The minor premise, the second sentence, is the application of a specific case to the major premise. Right, so Socrates here is a specific human. Because he fits into this broader category of humans, right, anything that applies to all humans also applies to Socrates. Make sense so far, everybody with me? Okay, the conclusion links up both ends of the premises, right? So in order for a syllogism to be valid, the subject of the major premise has to agree with the predicate or the object of the minor premise, right? And then the predicate of the conclusion will agree with the predicate of the major premise. That's what has to happen in order for a syllogism to be valid, right? So to give you another example, um, wrote it down here, okay, right, reptiles, do not have fur. Crocodiles are reptiles. Crocodiles do not have fur. Right. This lines up the same way, right? 
Subject of major premise is predicate of minor premise. Right, we're applying a specific case here, crocodiles, to a general cat, a statement about a general category, reptiles. And because croc crocodiles are indeed reptiles, they're members of this larger category, anything that applies to a reptile applies to a crocodile, right? Now, what if I were to rephrase this a little bit? What if I were to switch this up a little bit? We keep the major premise the same, right? Reptiles do not have fur. But we move the rest of it around. Crocodiles do not have fur. Therefore, crocodiles are reptiles. Is this still valid? Is it still a valid syllogism? Yeah. yeah. Why do you think it is? Well, no, it can't be because you have to have this thing at the, like the reptiles, reptiles have to be in the middle to be because fur. it has to. Exactly, yeah. Reptiles has to, has to come before fur, right? We have to apply the specific case to the category before we can make this kind of conclusion about it, right? Syllogisms don't actually test truth, right? They don't test the truth of a proposition. They just test whether a proposition is or is not logical. Right? So, if I were to say, for example, all dogs can fly, Hope, my Labrador Retriever, is a dog. Therefore, Hope can fly. Is this a logically valid syllogism? Yeah. yeah. It makes logical sense, or it follows logically. Everything's in the right place. Right? Hope is a specific instance of the larger category dog. And so everything that applies to dogs should apply to Hope, right? But, can dogs fly? And please answer this correctly. <laughs> dogs cannot fly, right? Yes. Dogs do not have the power to take to the air. So this is a valid syllogism, but it's untrue, right? So a syllogism does not test for truth. It only tests for the logical validity of a particular proposition. The syllogism is only three lines, yeah. Now, an enthymeme is a syllogism in which either one of the premises or the conclusion is implied rather than directly stated. So an enthymeme sort of works by suggesting to you some other idea, some linking idea that's supposed to be in there but is absent, right? So let's play with a couple of examples here. Right. So, enthymemes. Sometimes enthymemes, by the way, will actually be longer than syllogisms because enthymemes tend to occur more naturally in conversation than syllogisms do. But yeah, first example. A bigger burger is a better burger the burgers are bigger at Burger King right this is from an ad from the 90s What's the missing idea here? What's the unstated idea here? The burgers are better at Burger King. And why are the burgers better? Because they're bigger. bigger. Because they're bigger, right? <laughs> yes. A bigger burger is a better burger, right? Essentially, this is, just, this is just a syllogism without the conclusion, right? A bigger burger is a better burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King. Therefore, the burgers are better at Burger King, right? You can just fill in that last sentence, and you've basically got a syllogism. 
All right, give you another example. The defendant's prints are all over the gun. He must be guilty. What are the missing links between these ideas? Well, it's like you said earlier, one, you can interpret what the ending will be well as with that one, it's a blank statement. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Just, uh, so, well, it's like you said, you can fill in that last sentence. Sure. Which is in the conclusion they're wanting you to come towards. Also, yeah. that one, you're blankly stating what the conclusion should be. Yeah, the conclusion should be right. The conclusion here isn't what's missing, right? Mm -hmm. The conclusion here is stated he must be guilty. The defendant's prints are all over the gun. But we're missing with the linking logic here, right? Mm -hmm. So if the defendant's prints are all over the gun, why must he be guilty? Well, had not have your prints get on the gun. He touched it. Yeah. The fact that his prints are on the murder weapon, right, indicates that he handled the murder weapon. Now, must be guilty because of that is maybe a little bit of a leap, right? But the fact that his prints are all over the gun do at least show that he handled the gun, right? That's the missing logical link here. Right, that the prosecutor is leaving unstated. The defendant's prints are all over the gun. This means he handled the gun. And therefore likely used it. Right. Everybody still with me? Okay, so basically like what we're trying to do with these, right, is figure out what that kind of invisible linking logic is. All right, here's another one from, like, enthememes occur a lot in advertising, right? Because advertising um, works by sort of getting you to fill in some of the blanks about the product for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. This one you may have even heard before. With a name like Smuckers, It has to be good. What's the missing logic here? Why, why does the product have to be good if it has a name like Smuckers? That's what they want you to think, right? Certainly. Okay, Smuckers is good, right? So yeah, Mackenzie. Oh, that name is like a special type of Amazon? Yeah, it's, yeah it, it's the name of a familiar and popular product, right? So one way we can interpret this, right, is that they're banking on your familiarity with their product, right? You have your, your familiarity with their company name to sell jam and jelly, right? But there's also a... There's also a joke implied in here, right? Does Smuckers sound like a very appetizing name? No. Does it really sound like something you want to eat? No, it, it sounds a little disgusting, right? Mm -hmm. So you could also read this as like, with a name as hideous as Smuckers, right? This must be a damn good jelly. Right? We must really put a lot of faith in this jelly if we're going to put this name on it. All right. How many of you have seen, um, uh, what the hell is that stupid movie? Uh, David Spade is the voice of the emperor. Patrick Warburton is his little guard friend. Uh, it's a Emperor's Disney movie. The Emperor's New Groove. Groove. Yes. Yes. There's uh, an exchange between the two of them, right? The emperor is basically going to bulldoze a village, right, for his own pleasure. So we have our little guard friend says to... 
Fee Emperor. You're forcing an entire village out of their homes just for you. And the emperor responds, and that's bad. What's the logical leap the emperor isn't making here? <clears throat> What's the logical leap his friend wants him to come to? That he's being selfish? Yeah. That he's behaving selfishly, right? That destroying a whole village to make something for to build something for himself is selfish, right? And what does the emperor not understand about selfishness? That yeah, that selfishness is supposed to be bad, right? Okay, I think we're getting this, but I'm just going to give you two more. Going to give you two more examples, right, just to make sure uh, before. We move on to something else, right? So this one is from an episode of The Simpsons. Right. Montgomery Burns, the richest man in Springfield, has um, apparently died and been buried, and his funeral is being covered on the news. And the newsman says, a philanthropist, a humanitarian a man of peace these are just a few of the men who have come to spit on Montgomery Burns' grave. <clears throat> what is this suggesting? What's the what's the implied premise here about Montgomery Burns? That he wasn't very nice. Yeah, that uh, Montgomery Burns must have been a real shit, right? If people who are noted for their goodness and kindness are showing up at his funeral to spit on his grave, right? Now the setup for the joke here as well is right, you know, like usually when somebody dies, uh, they're like, you know, somebody noteworthy, right? And they're covering it on the news. What sorts of things do they say about them? They were good people? Yes. You know, they, they focus on the person's accomplishments, right? You know, the things that they did to be remembered positively, right? So when the newsman says, a philanthropist, a humanitarian, a man of peace, right? You're supposed to think he's talking about Montgomery Burns. And then he switches it around. He's like, no, these are the guys who came to, sh to spit on Montgomery Burns' grave, right? So, right, implied premise here, right? Is that Burns was a real bastard. One, uh, one more. This comes uh, from a Public Enemy song from the late 80s. Called Fight the Power. Elvis was a hero to most. But he never meant shit to me. Straight up racist that sucker was. Simple and plain. Oh, fuck him and John Wayne.
Now, the stated premise here is in itself pretty damning towards Elvis, right? What is this, what, what is the, you know, what's the guy coming out and saying about Elvis? Just coming out and saying it. Yeah, that Elvis was a racist, right? Now, his justification for this, right, which again is not here stated, is that Elvis, uh, particularly early in his career, recorded a lot of songs that had been written and performed originally by black artists and made a lot of money doing it, but those original artists never saw any of that money. But why pair him up here with John Wayne? What, what's, what's the suggestion here about American heroes? That they're racist. Yeah, that white people's heroes, right, are complicit in this history of racism, right? right this is the, the linking logic between Elvis and John Wayne here, right? Okay, so what I want you guys to go out and do with this, right? I want you to just sort of go out into the wild and find five anthememes, right? Five, you know, sort of little statements, you know, scenes from a movie, scenes from a TV show, passages from a book, advertisements, lyrics from a song, whatever, right, where you see these kinds of unstated premises, right? And I want you to try to pull out what the unstated logic is, right, what that unstated connecting logic is. Now, I am aware that there are websites that give you examples of enthymemes, right? I know what those websites are. Do not go to those websites. Instead, what I want you to do is just try to find these out in your everyday life, your everyday listening and viewing habits, right? Try to find enthymemes in the wild and figure them out. And look, it's like, you know, if, if you, you know, if you don't get it right on the first go, right, that happens, it's okay, right, you know? I will look at these, you know, I'll be looking at these as well and I can explain to you, you know, where you maybe took a logical left turn. Right, the point is just to try it, and get a little feedback. But the reason I want you to be doing this, the reason I think this assignment is particularly important is because one thing that we often forget about when we're writing is that we need to explain to our reader why the conclusion, like how we got to the conclusions we reached about our evidence. Right. We tend to go from piece of evidence to our interpretation of that evidence, but we don't, we, we assume that the reader understands that, right? We assume automatically that the reader understands how we got there. And what I want you guys to be doing when we write longer, more formal papers is explaining, sh basically showing me the work, right? I want you to show me how you got from piece of evidence to interpretation of evidence. So like, to go back to day one when I had you guys try to interpret me. Okay, right. Dr. Moyer is married. How do we know? What's her evidence? You have a wedding ring. Yeah. Right, Dr. Moyer wears a ring on his left hand ring finger. Right, that's our piece of evidence. And the linking logic there is that this is where people wear wedding rings, right? So 
So what we actually have here is an, is an example of what's called uh, the Toulmin method of reasoning. It's basically a three part, like the syllogism, it has three parts. It actually has about eight or nine if you're doing the full, the full more thing, but we're not gonna do that because that's a little bit more intense than we need, right? So you start with a piece of data, you make a claim about that data, but the claim has to be justified by what's called a warrant, right? The warrant is that linking logic between the data and the claim. To give you another example of this, I make the claim that I am a U.S. citizen. The data that I use to back this up is that I was born in Pennsylvania. So what's my warrant then for the claim? Why can I claim that I'm a U.S. citizen because I was born in Pennsylvania? Because Pennsylvania is part of the U.S. And so therefore... Yeah. Pennsylvania is part of the U.S. And anyone born on U.S. soil is a U.S. citizen, right? Legally. also includes you know military bases overseas and if you're born on an embassy right those also count as US soil but yeah so my warrants linking my claim to my data is that the place where I was born is in the United States and anyone born in the United States is a US citizen right yeah Cindy can you uh, switch data and claim because can it, the claim be I was born Um, I am a U.S. citizen couldn't be the data in this case, right? Um, because being born in Pennsylvania is the more specific, and is, is the thing I could actually demonstrate, right? It's the thing I would have to demonstrate in order to get proof of U.S. citizenship, right? So if I wanted to get, say, say I'm like I want to, you know, get a passport for the first time or something, right? I have to prove I'm a citizen in order to do that. And so I need to have my birth certificate and probably some other documents that say that I was born here. I have to have naturalization papers or, you know, basically some evidence that I'm a U.S. citizen. So does the data have to be the more specific quality of the three? The data has to be the thing that actually backs up your claim. So usually that's going to be the specific observation, right, or the specific piece of information. And most claims are going to need more than one piece of data to really, add, to really back them up. Um, I've just used here you know, a couple of very simple examples to show you how this works, right? Is that a question or are you just stretching? Just stretching, okay. All right, so <clears throat> here's what I want to do with this. Uh, now, I want to do another observation exercise, and I want to make sure that what we're doing as we look at this image is that we're linking our interpretations of it to the data we're observing. Right? So I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to put a picture up here on the projector. It would be nice if they had like one of those little hook things, but they don't. I'm not going to give you any context for the picture uh, yet. I want to see what you can do with it on your own first. 
But I just want you to sit, take five minutes, and write down as many specific observations as you can about this image, okay? Try to get down into granular detail. Let me know if you can't, uh, if it's not quite in focus yet, but let me know if you can't see it properly. Um, I'll go shut the other light off. Five minutes with it, write down everything that you notice about it. Bad. If you feel like you've you know got everything you can out of it, just keep staring at it until something else comes to you. And, you know, it's it's uncomfortable, but you know, but it works.
しい。So what have you got? It has to be cold. They're both wearing jackets. Okay. So the data here, right? The observations that they're both that both figures are wearing jackets, right? That it's cold would be an interpretation of that data, right? So yeah, both figures. Good. What else do you notice? The photo is uh, black and white. So okay. In the conclusion, it's an old photo. Black and white photo. Okay. There's what a statue else? behind it. Statue behind figures. Yep. Okay. Good. It might also help if we think about where the statue is behind them. Is it behind and level? Is it behind and above? That's higher. Yeah, behind and above, right? Yeah. All right. Good. Keep going. What makes you think different time period? The clothes. Okay, so the clothes that they're wearing are no longer fashionable, right? They would. They're not fashionable circa 2018. Keep going. What else, what else did you get from this? They're both white. Okay, yep. Both figures are white. Let's try digging a little bit more deeply into one of the figures. So pick one and start making observations or comments here. Okay. What makes you think he looks angry? Compared to her, when he's smiling, he's kind of like having a smirk. Um, okay, yeah, he's, he's smirking, right? Okay, what else can we see about, let's focus on the man's face for What else do we notice about his face? Yeah, big mustache, like walrus stash, right? <laughs> big mustache, what else? He's wearing glasses. He's wearing glasses. Anything else you notice about his head or his face? Got a hat. Okay. He's wearing a big hat, right? What about his hair? Long it's short. Kind of curled on. Yeah, kind of, not long, but kind of shaggy, right? Okay, so let's just stick with this figure for a minute. What else do we, so moving away from the face, what else do we observe about him? He has a printed shirt on and a vest. Okay, yep, he's wearing a vest and a printed shirt. Tell if he's like if he has his hands on his hips or is his hand just behind him, like yeah, you can't see his hands, right? Yeah. But yeah, he's holding them behind his back like this. I can't tell if he's like <laughs> right. 
You were starting to say something. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. I can't tell if he's happy to be there or if he's just like, I'm here because she's making me be here. Because <laughs> he stands kind of like relaxed, but at the same time he's tense. Okay, well, what, what, what do we call, like, when you're standing with your hands behind your back like this, what is that posture conventionally called? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, the, like, people stand like this in specific contexts, right? Where, where do people learn to stand with their hands behind their back? In the military. In the military, yeah. That's the at-ease posture. But... You're not supposed to stand with your leg bent in the at ease posture, right? So, how might we interpret his posture? Is it hands behind back, but knee bent? Okay, <laughs> yeah, at least he, he's, he's someone who is not, probably not currently in the military, right? Has but, a military background. Yeah, we probably served in the military at one point. Because people don't usually naturally stand like that. No, they drill that in you. <laughs> but he's also doing, you know, he's also kind of undermining that a little bit with the bent leg, right? Hands behind back, bent leg. So yeah, it's a sort of at ease posture. Well, that would explain the stern face. Let's focus on the woman here for a minute. What do you notice about the woman? Okay, a woman is sitting. Right, man is standing, woman is sitting. Good. Well, what else do you notice about her? She's smiling. Okay, she's smiling. She's looking away from the camera. Mm -hmm. Right, not looking at camera. What about the man? Is he looking at the camera? Yeah, he's looking directly at it. Yeah. He is looking at us. Yeah, she is not. She's looking away. What else do you notice about her? She has a dress and a skirt on. Okay. Dress, skirt. And what more specifically could we say about her dress or her skirt? What do you notice about it? It's long. It's long. Yeah. Long and loose, right? It's long and loose, but does it really cover her? Her legs are kind of sticking out of it, right? She seems more calm and relaxed. Okay, why does she seem more calm and relaxed? She kind of has her bent back. She's smiling. She's looking somewhere else. Okay, bent back, smiling. Um, that, that I can tell you they are not. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, I mean, if, if, it, if it is a roof, it's a turf roof, right? Yeah, they are, they are not on a roof. All right, anything else you notice about the woman? Boots? Okay, yeah, she's wearing long boots, right? Long boots, short curly hair. All right, anything else? Uh, she's actually buttoned up. Like yeah, and... she's buttoned up. He's unbuttoned. Yeah, good. Okay. So given the information we have here about these two figures, what kind of relationship is being projected here between them? And stick with what we can actually demonstrate with evidence, right? How is the person who composed this picture depicting the relationship between these two people? I wouldn't say a romantic couple, like maybe brother and sister. The way she's done. Kind of like okay. brother and sister. Okay, so you are interpreting their relationship to each other as non-romantic. Why exactly? They're not, they're not 
together. Yeah. They're kind so of it's like the separate. spacing between the two figures. Okay. Usually when you want yeah. to have a relationship, they're all close together. Mm -hmm. There's there's yeah, there's distance between them, right? Mm -hmm. They're not um, and we have this great big open space between their bodies. Right? Usually when you see like a wedding portrait or something like that, people are standing even, you know, you know, from like the 19th century, people are standing close together, right? Or holding hands or something, they're making some kind of contact. Yeah, are these people making any physical contact with each other? No. Are they even looking at each other? No. He is looking at us, right? And she's looking at something else off in the distance. Okay, so if not a romantic relationship, right? The two figures don't seem to be interacting with each other. What then is going on between these two? Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it seems like she's vulnerable and she's not. It's okay. Control. Why would you say that she looks vulnerable and he looks like he's in control? She's like slumped over and he's standing up straight. Okay, yeah, she's sitting, right? He's standing over her. He's looking at us and smirking. She's looking away, right? So the fact that she's not making eye contact with anyone or anything could suggest what sorts of feelings? Yeah, shyness, vulnerability, even potentially fear, right? Yeah, to be honest, it kind of just looks like, like they were just walk, looks like they were just off in the distance, somebody came with a camera, and he took a pose, and she was just kind of. <laughs> Look at <all> the okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little bit of context for this now, and then I want you to try to think through what you think the rhetoric of this picture is, like what it's trying to persuade us of. Um, one thing I noticed none of you pointed to is this little symbol. Well, I saw, but I thought it was just kind of like a stamp on the photo. Yeah, like, that's what, yeah, that's Photoshop. Like a watermark. Yeah. Like they're like modeling. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually a publisher's mark. And if we look around the edges of the photo, what is this? Newspaper? It's a book jacket. It's the cover of a book. Hmm. So, what purpose does a book cover generally serve? Okay, yeah. It gives you a visual representation of something about the book, right? Does it necessarily give you a visual representation of the plot? I mean, when it comes down to it, what is the book cover's real purpose? What is it really supposed to do? It's supposed to be appealing so that way. Exactly. The idea is to get you to buy the goddamn book, right? That's what a book cover's purpose is. Is to get you interested enough to pick up the book, hold it, and take it over to the cash register and fork over your hard-earned money. So, how is this trying to accomplish that? What is this giving? Like, I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about the book. So the author's name is Richard Brodigan. The American writer. The novel is called Trout Fishing in America. Wow. That covers very misleading. <laughs> yeah, the book also has very little to do with actual trout fishing. Yeah. But so, given the cover here, like what, what's the publisher doing to try to sell that? What, how are they trying to sell the book? Um, what do you usually see on a book cover that's missing here? Yeah, no title, right? What else do you usually see in a book cover that's missing here? I think I might give the author and all that, but the book sometimes too. Yeah, no title, no author, right? Why? 
Why do you think the publisher doesn't put this information on there? Why do you think they give you this cover with no title and no author? Because it's interesting. Yeah, because you're not used to seeing something like that, right? You're like, you expect the title to be a kind of signpost, right? This is going to tell me something about what the book is supposed to be about. You use the name of the author the same way, whereas if you're already familiar with a particular author's work, then you assume that other things that author writes are going to say, okay, if I liked one J.K. Rowling book, right, I'm probably going to like another one. But this doesn't give you either of those signposts. It doesn't give you anything familiar to hang on to here, right? So it's trying to use the opposite strategy to get you to pick the book up and look at it, right? By not telling you anything about it. It just gives you this picture. And how is this picture specifically meant to draw you in? What do the, what sorts of attitudes or ideas do the two figures suggest based on what we've already sort of pulled out about them? Okay, what, why do you say history? You mean history between the two figures or some other kind of history? Okay. But also, yeah, also history in a general term too. I mean, because of how the picture looks. I mean, you got Benjamin Franklin in the background as a little statue, and you've got the yeah. black and white facing, so that I guess mentions age, and also the way they're uh -huh. it's pretty retro, I guess, in comparison to nowadays and all that. Yeah. Well, I was the the book was published in the early '60s, uh, so yeah, it wouldn't <laughs> the way they're dressed wouldn't have been all that retro then, right? So yeah, we are looking at sort of the styles of 50 years ago. But yeah, we got Ben Franklin hovering over them in the background, right? So there is that kind of sense of American history in the picture. They're standing under his statue. What else might these figures suggest that would be appealing to somebody just browsing through a bookstore? It catches your eye. Okay, yeah, you want to figure out what the weird relationship is between these two figures, right? You've got the man who looks like, that doesn't, like, like you said, it doesn't look romantic. But you have the man kind of standing in this weird dominant position over the woman, right? Yet at ease with himself, clearly. And the woman sitting in the subordinate position kind of looking away. What about, let me, okay, given the context of the time period, right? Is this how normal, everyday, average people dressed in the 60s? Yeah, if you were just like a normal guy going, a normal white collar guy going to work, would you be wearing this to work? Now, how would you be dressed? Yeah, you probably you probably wearing a suit, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Think you know. Think Mad Men, right? You probably be wearing, you'd be wearing a suit, carrying a briefcase, and driving your car from your little suburban box um, to too. to the office in the city, right? What's that? <laughs> Fedoras too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you may very well be wearing a fedora, right? And you probably had you know a tri you know a triple martini for breakfast, right? <laughs> if lunches. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, because TV doesn't like this, but no, yeah, yeah. So like, the average person, right? The average white collar, educated working person would have been much more kind of buttoned down. But this guy's got shaggy hair and a mustache. He's wearing a slightly eccentric hat. And what about his pants? Jeans on. He's wearing jeans. Yeah. Now, wearing blue jeans in the '60s was much more of a kind of social statement than it is today, right? Everybody wears them now because they're comfortable. But in the 60s, if you were a person from an educated or white collar background walking around wearing jeans, 
right? It was a kind of counterculture statement, right? It was being, you, you were trying not to fit in with the button down, white collar working world. So, kind of like hippies? Yeah. She's got this kind of fluffy headband, too, right? So, yeah, they're being presented as, if not hippies per se, at least as being kind of counterculture y, right? Right. These are people who are not quite normal, people who are not quite, who are a little bit left of center. And so they're trying to use that, right, the personality of the figures in the picture to draw in a potential reader. Now how might they be using these sort of two ideas, the personality of the figures in the picture plus the reference to American history in the background Together, how might these things be working together to draw you in? Maybe to show, you know, the difference, and you know, every, everyone's not the white collar type. You mm -hmm. know, they're going to be laid back and relaxed, American. You know, sure. Maybe. I think I think you're on the right track there, right? I mean, who is this again in the background? Ben Franklin. It's Ben Franklin. Yeah. And what's Ben Franklin famous for? Hundred dollar bills. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a re there's a reason we call there's a reason they're called Benjamins, right? Yes. Franklin's face is stamped on them. But what what else is he famous for? Okay, helping to discover electricity, right? He never did the kite flying with the key experiment, right? That actually is you know that was a fiction, but. Right? <laughs> uh, well, lots of children probably got electrocuted before they really figured out what was going on there. But yeah, but yeah. So he he's noted as a scientist, right? What else? Uh, he, newspaper. Right? Okay, yeah. He was also a publisher. Mm -hmm. Right. He was a printer. Published newspapers. Published almanacs. Published books. Published pamphlets. So he has that relationship to text and to print. But why do we put him on the $100 bill? <laughs> yes. But we're trying to get it why he's important. I mean, like, you know, okay, being a scientist is great, right? Being a publisher is great. What did he do? I mean, yeah, with the American Independence Movement. Exactly, yeah. He's one of the prime movers behind the American Revolution, right? So not only is he revered for these sort of more mundane accomplishments, right? You know, making a fortune publishing books, you know, helping to, you know, under, advance our understanding of electricity, right? He didn't discover it, people already knew that it existed, but he did help advance our understanding of it. Um, but yeah, the big thing that gives him a place in American history is his role in the American Revolution. So, we got these two kind of hippie counterculture figures standing in front of a statue of a famous revolutionary. Right, so what they're doing is associating these figures with that idea of revolution and suggesting that revolution and change and being a friggin' weirdo is perfectly in line with traditional American values. Right, they're connecting themselves to the Ben Franklin tradition. Right, that's the idea here. Now, like a, what's picture. that? That just looks like a picture of my grandparents visiting a monument. That's, <laughs> that's when I were, that. were your grandparents hippies? <laughs> One of them, for sure. Okay, well, there we go. Well, she tied on mm -hmm. and sold shirts. That's what she did. Did she follow the dead around? <laughs> <laughs> when she could. So what is this book actually about? Um, it is a moderately psychedelic novel. Um, oh, so they cut the pill in half. They don't go the whole way. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, little little bit little bit of little bit of blo little blots, just little blots. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. No. Yeah. It, it, it's um, it's kind of hard to say, really, <laughs> what it's about. Uh, Brodigan's writing um, is. On the one hand, like it's a little bit kind of childlike and simplistic in style, but um, the settings and plots that he creates are kind of surreal. So yeah, it does also have yeah, it has a strong connection to like you know early twentieth century Dada and surrealism and you know basically a middle finger to the establishment kind of um, art styles. All right, so. One more bit of quick practice with the enthamine before I let you go, just so we're all clear on what it is I want you doing for next time we meet. You may or may not recognize this particular statement. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to suffering. I sense much fear. In you. What is Master Yoda's unstated premise here? You're on the path to the dark side. Yes. Fear is the path to the dark side. I sense much fear in you. Cute little blonde kid. Right? You are going to grow up to build a damn Death Star. Yes, that is the unstated premise. Good. All right. So that is all I have for you today. And remember the assignments uh, for not this coming Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. And remember that we won't be meeting next week. All right. Okay. Okay, so the assignment's not due next Tuesday. It's not, yeah, it's not due this coming Tuesday. It's due the following Tuesday. All right. Good luck to your wife. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.